As rain fell on the Great Dividing Range in Alpha, late June 2012, and the carbon tax loomed on the horizon, graziers settled in to hear the latest on climate science impacts on their business. The day was one of five field days organised by senior scientist Paul Jones from DAF. We've got some good information products there about managing um, for a variable and changing climate. Did you come here today thinking, gee, I better come and listen to these fellows because I know I'm, there's going to be an impact on my business in the next 10, 15, 20 years, you know? The first thing that everyone is aware of, in Queensland specifically, we have a highly variable climate. It has always changed in the past. We've had periods of prolonged drought. We've had you know, shorter but prolonged periods of above average seasons, such as the last couple of years. Dave McRae is a climate scientist working on climate risk. He publishes a weekly note, Climate Watch, in the Queensland Country Life and runs educational packages on managing for a variable and changing climate. To me, that's the first thing that's changed is always we've got change uh, and that is uh, certainly the mindset I encourage producers to take into it when they are thinking about climate change and especially in terms of you know, where change can be attributed back to human causes. When we look at the actual data one of the areas where there is a high degree of certainty and consensus is that we have had a warming background temperature. If we look at specifically for example winter temperatures we have had more milder winters you know, since 1980, uh, there has been that distinct warming sort of trend. Other areas of change certainly aren't as obvious. For example, if we look at rainfall across Queensland as a whole, you know, the change in rainfall experience to date is still well within the bounds of natural variability that we would expect for this part of the world. However, when we look at the model projections and things such as evapotranspiration, we, we will start to see that change come through. For Western Queensland, the climate has been predicted to shift to bigger rainfall events with longer dry periods in between. These can result in significant damage to pastures if adequate ground cover is not maintained. Possible impacts on climate change, of climate change in the grazing industry. You know, increasing heat stress impacting on animal performance, especially breeder cows. Uh, changes in water availability, if we get a higher uh, evaporation rate. Uh, if our rainfall becomes more variable, so we get an increased number of, uh, say, even if we kept our long-term average remaining roughly the same, but your rainfall, number of rainfall days decreases, but the rainfall intensity increases. So same amount of rainfall, but just falls in a shorter period of time. You, know, you may need infrastructure to make sure you can capture that water and store it for the consecutive number of dry days. Uh, and the, if we do go into the more extreme events, heat waves, wildfires, etc., like that, what is that? How does that impact on your production system? Peter Whip is a grazier and agribusiness consultant from Longreach. Peter is a climate champion and represents the beef industry at a national level on climate change and the issues interacting with the beef industry. Can I ask you another question? Do you reckon um, climate change will impact on your business in Alpha or? Jericho, wherever you're from. It already has been. Right? So climate change has had an impact on your grazing business, right? Anyone else? Big game enough to... Dave? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, has? Yeah. Peter is adamant that climate change will affect all aspects of agriculture, regardless of whether there is defendable evidence for greater variability. Whether you think there's an impact or you don't think there's an impact now, I'll guarantee 100% that your business will be impacted by climate change by, what's the date today? Another week, isn't it? While Peter thinks the carbon tax will have a detrimental impact on graziers, he is not so certain about the benefits from government schemes like the Carbon Farming Initiative. Is there any money in it? There's going to be a heap of money in carbon farming. I just don't think there's going to be much for us. The brokers, the auditors, the aggregators, they're all going to make a lot of money out of carbon farming. And we, we did some figures on one scheme that was floating around and um, out of all the carbon credit, all the money generated, the, the producer got between 5 and 15%. And so there was, what's that, 85% of it was going somewhere else. Most farmers have got a really good handle on climate variability. Like that, that's, it's part of, part of what they do every day, you know, especially in, in Queensland, Western Queensland, you know, climate variability is a fact of life. If, if you're not into climate variability, you know, you're not in the industry, basically. So in terms of that, they've got a really good understanding of managing for variability. That's something they do. The core business of being a beef producer 
is still what it's about. You know, you do, you do your fundamental basic stuff right and you do it really efficiently and you will be most profitable. And don't worry about, if, if the politics change and, and suddenly they decide to take soil carbon in and, and whatever, great. But in the meantime, just get on with being an efficient producer. You know, get your waters right, get your, you know, all those sort of things that you've always done. You know, you always had to do that. Um, it's no different. So get them right, be an efficient producer. All of that stuff will fall into place anyway. So you'll be looking after your past, you're looking after your missions, making money, do that first. And then if there's a spin-off from carbon farming, we'll do it. Peter has experienced a severe drought since moving to his property in 2000. Strategies he uses to address the harshness of the climate include rotationally grazing to improve the health of pastures, adjusting cattle during drought and having well distributed water points for efficient use of pastures. He showed people how his water infrastructure used to be. If you want to, I mean, if you want to get the most out of that place, you've got to do something about that, haven't you? Underutilisation, obviously. Like, there's obvious things there. If you're trying to look at paying back a debt or trying to make the most money out of that country, you've got to do something. And, and so what we've done so far is sort of look at doing that, you know? So, I mean, that's... You can still see we've still got some problems. Like, there's some still areas here we've got to sort out. But, like, a lot of this country here we've sorted out pretty quickly. And, I mean, as, as you fellows probably are doing. Astute and efficient land and stock management is what Peter sees as the key to prospering in variable climate, regardless of government policy on carbon. The spin-off of doing that is that it's improved productivity. And the, and the figure that, that Steve um, put up before that I reckon is the key, it's not so much that, that you reduced your emissions, but it's the reduced the emissions per kilo of beef. Because at the end of the day, I'm actually running a lot more cattle there than the previous people, which means I'm emitting a lot more methane, a lot more all the bad stuff. But as long as I'm producing about 20 times the amount of beef they were, I'm actually moving ahead. I'm actually a climate friendly beef producer. So it's not about, um, you know, saying, oh, we all have to destock and let the trees come back. I mean, I don't think that's what it's about at all. We can't afford to. Apparently by 2050, we've actually got to double food production just to feed the world. So there's no way we can let all the trees come back and still do that. It's just not going to happen. So I think what we've got to do, though, is to say we've got to produce as much beef as we can in the most efficient way that we can. When planning for the months ahead, indicators like the SOI, which is strongly correlated with average rainfall in Queensland, can help to support management decisions. The SOI is Southern Oscillation Index, is a simple uh, index we use to explain the difference in barometric air pressure between Darwin and Tahiti. If it's positive, it means we have more low pressure systems here. If it's negative, we, we have more high pressure systems here. Uh, more high pressure systems generally equals below average rainfall. The SOI is interpreted to forecast the chance of exceeding or falling short of the median rainfall. We can use things such as the SOI to develop rainfall forecasts. Uh, this current, uh, and our standard one is a three month seasonal outlook. So it gets updated every month, the new three month seasonal outlook. So what we're looking at here is the chance of getting above median rainfall for June, July, August, based on a near zero phase at the end uh, over April, May. So all I've done there is take all the historical rainfall data for those three months uh, and for those periods when it was neutral at the end of May and just see what occurred. It's a bit of a wishy washy outlook at the minute. But generally speaking, if you look at central Queensland, 50 to 60% chance of getting above median rainfall. You know, close to average. If it was uh, strongly negative, SOI was strongly negative, that'd be down to say 15 to 20% chance of getting above median rainfall. Much lower probabilities. I know it's a percentage based forecast or a probability based forecast. So if I say there's uh, like a 70% chance of getting above median rainfall, you've still got a 30% chance of getting above below median rainfall. Seven times out of 10, you get it. Three times out of 10, you don't. At this stage, that's as good as what the science is. David and Peter shared their experience and knowledge, but both pointed to the resourcefulness of Western Queensland graziers, seeing this as the key to weathering climate challenges. So in summary, to finish off, uh, as you're all aware, you live in a highly variable climate now. You already manage for that highly variable climate now. So you look at what works well for you in your production system, what doesn't work well, work out what to concentrate on. So the questions are, how could increasing temperatures impact on your grazing enterprise? Um, 
over time, how could increasing evaporation impact on your grazing enterprise, how could increasing rainfall, and can we adapt to respond to those challenges and opportunities. So it's not about doom and gloom, it's about looking at what works well now and trying to work out how to progress that into the future. Productivity, efficiency, climate stuff, pasture, all fits together. You know, if you're an efficient operator, you'll have good pastures, you'll have low emissions, and you'll have good money in the bank. Or you'll have good profit anyway. Thank you.